how to build your dream massage therapy team. Um, for anyone watching that is um, not familiar with Clinic Sense as in, and is intrigued to try it, uh, here is the deal. Clinic Sense is your all-in-one practice management solution, and it is their mission to help you run and grow a successful business. What makes Clinic Sense unique is how easy it is to use and all the tools and features available to simplify running your business. And on top of that, it has incredibly fast and friendly customer support. They get back to you within minutes, I swear. So a huge shout out to our customer support team. Um, with Clinic Sense, your charting is easy, fast, customizable, and HIPAA and PAPEDA compliant. Scheduling is simple for both you and your clients. Invoicing, payments, and reporting tools help you feel confident about your finances. And then, of course, the marketing tools help you build and maintain a really strong relationship with your clients. This increases your client retention and manages your online business reputation. Um, if you are not a, a customer, once again, and you are intrigued, we do have a 14-day free trial. Um, again, give me a shout in the comments and I'll help you get signed up. Just a quick look at our agenda. Um, we'll go through three ways to grow your team, how to run an intentional practice, how to find awesome talent, management and learning styles. And then, of course, we'll have our Q&A. But again, pop any questions into the comment section throughout. And then I have the pleasure of introducing our guest, uh, Nisha. She is a business coach and mentor to hundreds of massage therapists. And she's sharing tactics she's used to create her own business success over the last 24 years. Um, I'll leave the screen up for us, but... I think I'll give it up to her to tell us a little bit more about her experience. And thank you so much for joining, Alicia. Thank you so much, Nicole. It's lovely to be here today. Um, yeah, so I've been massaging for 24 years now. It's kind of, it's crazy. It's like, that's like a lot. That's more than half of my life. And um, I started out just having no clue what I was doing. I wanted to, just wanted to help people. Um, and so as I built my kind of clinical experience and decided one day, all right, I'm going to hire, this will be great. I'll hire a team member. Wonderful. And it didn't go so well. And so I had to learn so much of what I'll share today because of the mistakes I made. I mean, my first therapist that I hired had one person working I had one client after 12 months so like there was a lot of things I really had to learn from that grassroots level and take a long time and kind of make heaps of mistakes and learn from them so yeah really excited to be here today amazing thank you so much and you're joining from the states today I know from I, th I think whoever watched your um, intro um, your intro video into the group you are Australian but you're um, joining us from the states from the conference today right that's right. Yeah, we're in Tampa, Florida for the AMTA conference. I'm attending it with my business partner and really excited. I'm really stoked because it's 2 a.m. at home. So I'm thrilled that we get to chat today at a very sensible time. Yes. <laughs> yes, me too. And I'm glad that you have adjusted because 2 a.m. would have been a struggle. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. So why don't we jump straight into it? Um, the first point on our agenda is three ways to grow your team. And you mentioned there are a few ways and you can find the best way that works for you and your clinic. So why don't you tell us a bit more about that? Um, look, I think being able to hire someone, it most of the people that we work with when we're working with therapists who are looking to hire, they often really want to share the passion that they have. You know, like they're really passionate about, they know how to do this, they know how to treat people and it's like something's come up, they're just ready for extra level of growth and new things. And I think that that is often something that people don't talk about you know, when they're ready to hire, when they're looking for those new people. It's like, you know what, share with someone what exciting things are, like what is, what's the heartbeat behind what you have? And I think that when we talk, look at that intentional culture, being able to be really intentional with the way that we are hiring and actually share the kind of excitement and enthusiasm of, I want to I want to take, you know, sometimes a baby therapist or someone who doesn't have as much experience as myself and bring them in. And I want to teach them what I know because I've learned so much over the last however many years you've been in the industry. Um, and I think that that's something that really helps to begins an initiation process of that intentional culture that creates um, being an employer of choice. Amazing. Is that something you feel like you've learned um, in your experience as an employee yourself? 
Yes, definitely. Um, I was, so I, I ran my massage clinic out of I mean, my massage business, out of my lounge room to start with. And then I moved into being uh, into a chiropractic clinic. Uh, and it was one of those situations where it's like, I don't know if I was an employee contractor, if oh, yeah. I was <laughs> into room. Uh, there was no written contracts. That was, it was all like, oh, who owns the clients at the end of the day what happens when you look like oh it was it was that nightmare and yeah. how it, I learned so much about what it was like to have great leadership team and what it was like to have not such a great leadership team it was a husband and wife team and one of them was brilliant in communication one of them not so great in communication um, I also <laughs> worked at taste bars and um, and just learned so much about what is what is great management and what is not great management and what do, what did I enjoy and what I didn't enjoy and what brought the best out in me and what didn't bring the best out mm. and I think that's really important to learn as part of your bringing on board people skills yeah and um, as far as the differences between if someone's trying to find the best model for their business um, I know you mentioned you know renting out a room or if you want a subcontract or if you've got if you want to get a whole team how do you decide what's the best fit that's a great question. It really comes down to the level of control that you want. Um, I'm just to be really clear, I'm not a HR expert. I just have an enormous <laughs> amount of experience. Yeah, just so we're really clear. Um, so there are basically there's three ways to grow your team. You can rent out a room. So basically, you know, you charge per day or per week, and someone comes in, they run their own business from your space, and they provide everything in terms of marketing, whatever, whoever they see is retained in their database, all that kind of stuff. It's just literally they are saying, I want this four walls. That's what I'm going to rent out, and I'm going to run my business in it. Then you've got subcontracting, and subcontracting is, is technically where somebody would bring their own tools so they would provide their own linen oils marketing things like that and they would do that on behalf of their business and they would work and subcontract for a clinic and then you've got employment and employment there are some federal and state requirements um not that, like I said I'm not an expert on these <laughs> things but I understand and have an awareness around them um, and it does come down to your level of control because as an employee, you can ask somebody to do things between clients. So you can ask them to do some laundry. You can ask them to help you with your marketing. You can ask, ask them to do some rebooking or, or call clients you haven't seen in a while. Like you can actually ask them to do more things than you can as a subcontractor because technically they're meant to be able to run their own business. And the example we'd use is if you were building a house and you had a contract to come and do the plumbing as the person who is building the house, as the builder that's building it, they don't care if it's Stephen or Peter or Dave or I, I don't know what your tradie names are, but in Australia, a contractor is called a tradie. We shorten everything and add E to the end of it. So mm -hmm. you don't care which tradie comes. But obviously in a service-based business, technically they can replace themselves. And that's a little odd. It, wouldn't, it doesn't happen, but technically they can. And so a lot of people are like, oh, well, I was a subcontractor, so that's how I'll hire and what we tend to mm. say is learn what is, like you really need to learn what is actually, what does that mean in terms of the, the requirements and obligations that you have in growing your team, but also what you can expect of them. Um, and there is, there's a lot of, yeah, there's a big list and criteria for both and I won't necessarily go into those today, but hopefully that gives you a bit of a picture of the three different ways that you can hire. What do you think people are assuming about certain business models? Are there any misconceptions that you've come across? Uh, loads of misconceptions and I think mm. it I think it's in if we're looking at that intentional culture be really clear with what you're offering are you offering a room rental and what mm. is what 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 are your obligations what are your not obligations what are you prepared to say yes to what are you prepared to say no to and it's the same if you're going to have subcontractors come in be really clear with like the, there is absolutely reason to have subcontractors subcontractors will lower the risk for you because obviously if they don't work they don't get paid mm. so often that is where people go oh that will be easier I'll do that whereas there are lots of ways to actually employ um therapists that isn't um, as possibly onerous or scary when you know what you're doing, you know, when you, when you know what requirements, the state and federal requirements that you have um, and, you know, making sure that you're ensuring that you're doing them. Often therapists that are looking for work are also looking for a different level of risk or um, buy-in for themselves as well. So some people like as a business owner, we maybe wouldn't want to work for some sort of minimum wage, you know, because it's like, Okay, I know how much I can earn when yeah. I go and work for myself. 
However, we're, we're the unicorns in this because we are driven by different things. And often people who are looking for an employment situation want the consistency of a regular paycheck, knowing that every Thursday they're going to get money in their bank, regardless of how many hours they work. Like they actually, people, some people really like that certainty and will chase it, especially when you're not kind of massaging their hands into bloody stumps because yeah. you're actually... <laughs> care of them you know they're not going to walk away from it going oh I had to say no (laughs) (laughs) Um, because if you were a passionate therapist who loves to actually share and mentor the people that you that work with you then you're going to teach them safe and appropriate boundaries how many clients would they like to be seeing each week and make sure that it's financially profitable for yourself but also that you're going to have a client uh, a staff member with you for a long time and I think that that's understanding what the three are and being really clear on what it is not just assuming I'll just do that because it's easier because often it's not and it, it it I think having that intentionality um I heard one of my clients once my massage clients once said to me when he was teaching his daughter to drive the, the, what he said to her was every time you get in the car you're going to make thousands of decisions make sure they're good ones every time And I think it's similar with business. You know, we have Mm. to make thousands of decisions every day, every single week in our business. So make sure they're really great decisions and be really educated well before you jump into hiring. And I think that that makes all the difference because then you know what you're willing to do, what you have to do um, and what's possible. Yeah. Yeah. Love that. If someone isn't sure where to start, what is the, I don't know if this is even, um, even applies, but is there a safest option or an easiest option? probably just renting a room out it's it's very yeah. black and white. you know it's like basically you're going to run your thing in there great and you're going to pay me money for that privilege tick mm. you know like and I mean again one of my beautiful coaching clients once said that if and make sure it's written down um but if you ever have to pull the contract out probably the relationship is over <laughs> you know like yeah it just, it's it, this is what this is clearly what we're stating this is what we're doing we've both signed it it goes into a drawer um and hopefully it never needs to come out because usually if it's coming out and you're like section two but you're yeah. like <laughs> yes. know, there's no relationship there now <laughs> yeah <laughs> i guess this takes us quite nicely into running your intentional practice and how do you where do you even start I think it is so important to know what it is that you stand for. Mm. And, you know, I, I think a lot of people talk about how, you know, knowing your values and knowing your mission and what you do and that sort of stuff. Um, however, it is, I think in today's culture, particularly with our younger generation, they want to know what a business stands for. I mean, when, even when we look at Instagram, people will follow brands before they'll purchase them, particularly younger people. And, Knowing what it is that we stand for is something, it's a process to go through because 96% of what we do is unconscious. You know, we're not thinking beat heart, beat heart. It just Mm. happens. There's so much of our patterns of behavior happen just unconsciously. So discovering our values is not so much looking for that unicorn to go, what on earth are they? It's actually just discovering what are the things that really, when this happens, when X, Y, Z happens in my business or in my clinic or through the day, great day, love that. What's getting up my nose? You know, what kind of irks me and annoys me when that happens? Because that's often, they're the two ways that you can know what your values actually already are, but you might not have actually languaged them. And so when I look at my business, there's a timeline of before understanding my values and after understanding my values. And before understanding my values, there was a lot of hit and miss guessing. And I, I mean... I'm a therapist. Okay. Like I like, I like people to like me that was, and especially back then I was an absolute, I'm a recovering people pleaser. So <laughs> for me, when, I, when a staff member didn't want to do something or pushed back against something without knowing my values, it was really hard mm. to have any heavy, to have any influence because it was like, Oh no, they're okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll just do what they want. Cause you know, but that, that did not create an intentional culture mm. and it did create a really great positive intentional working culture either because the staff were saying well what they wanted was what happened and then I tried to kind of you know um adapt my behavior to that which is not intentional it's kind of like the tail is wagging the dog as opposed to the other way around whereas when I did some work to discover what other business values and it wasn't just 
Leash came up with these ideas. I, at the time, I had um, three beautiful team members working with me, and I we talked to them, and I'm like, why are we the most? Why are we the big, biggest clinic in our area? There's about thirteen thousand people in Ocean Grove, where I'm from. Um, and there were 30 other massage clinics within a two and a half mile radius. So it's not, this is like a really densely heavily populated area. And at that time we were seeing 75 to 80 clients per week. We were, we were the most expensive clinic in the area. We had an 85% rebooking rate across the team. I'm like, hmm. so what, is, what are we doing well that we don't even know? And so actually the team helped me to create our mission and our values because it was more just eliciting what was already happening or creating the recipe for why we were already doing great things. And I think that because because I didn't have that and then create a team, I had a team and we had to do that. I think by bringing them in on that process, they had way more buy-in than if, you know, Alicia Crook, I've had a really good idea, jump in. Hey guys, this, this is our values now. And they're, mm. you know, that it doesn't, <laughs> they're, not, they're not brought along for the ride in that way. So I think that being able to say, this is, this is what I stand for. Well, then when someone came and challenged something, so like, hey, I really don't like, um, like we put our rates up, you know, and they didn't like that. They were like, mm. they were really against it and, and didn't really like it. I'm like, well, actually, one of our values is to raise the professional standard of massage. And we can't do that if there's no money in the account. Yeah, like if I can't pay people, if I can't pay the rent, we're not raising the standard and we're not living out that value of excellence either. So so what it meant was that if we had challenges or people weren't meeting KPIs, that I had the opportunity to say, well, how does that live in alignment with this value? And that it just changed the game. And it meant it like I didn't have to be a people pleaser because it was it wasn't just and it wasn't just I've had this really good idea and you should do it. It was like, well, we've agreed on this set of values. Mm. So how can we together look at this out there and say, right, how do we get in alignment with that value? And I, it just, it started to really change the culture and it really, it was like, it made people think and they started to, they were more invested. They actually, mm. they're, they were more invested in, in what they had, what we were doing. That's mm. such an interesting um, and sounds like, I, I wish I knew this 10 years ago, to be honest. <laughs> it's, um, it's such a good way to like not people please because I'm a recovering people pleaser myself and to have those values to fall back on. Um, that they signed up for, that they agree with, that they feel like they align with, that's amazing. Do you would you do that in onboarding? Is that something you would like set aside time for? Hey, this is our so, these are our values. Yes. That was very much the first thing that we did. So mm. um, on their first day, they would come in, we would we'd go through a check. I had a checklist of what I would, you know, what I was going to teach them on their first day. Um, and we would always start with mission, vision and values. So before we got to, here's a key, here's how to get in, here's the evacuation plan, you know, here's our, here's our, um, our, our systems and all that. Like before we got to any of that, it was always starting with that mission, vision and values. Absolutely. And I want to ask also about creating that culture and making sure making sure it stays that culture stays when you bring on a new hire maybe it doesn't go so well and they don't really align how do you keep that culture and keep your values strong i think first of all being intentional helps and the yeah. way i describe it it's it's a little bit in your face but this is a, maybe it's an australian term i'm not sure but you wouldn't wear bikinis to church <laughs> and no one has to say not appropriate yeah i mean sure some churches maybe you can but you wouldn't wear bikinis to church and the reason is because you know the culture is not okay. You just know that that's not an appropriate yeah. thing to do. <laughs> when you're really clear, not only are you clear on your values, but you communicate them effectively and they're up on the wall. And it's not just like, you know, every bank in the world has like integrity as one of their, you know, values. Yeah. That's that's not the kind of values I'm talking about. I'm talking about values that you have crafted really intentionally and beautifully. And you're like, I'm proud of these, you know? And so what happens when somebody steps in who's not a cultural fit is it becomes really obvious because oh. they're sticking out like it's like they're trying and you can see they'll try and drag the, the, the oh but blah 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 you know that's this is how it's written down but this is how we really do it no that's that's actually not okay because the reason that we do it this way is because xyz it helps us align to this and when it's continued like it's a continual cycle it's it's much easier to call out behavior and oh. often they will self-select because it's just like, oh, that doesn't work here. 
Yeah. <laughs> like, just literally, it just isn't flying because it's not how we roll. We don't have time for that kind of behavior. So mm. you either change or move on. Yeah. <laughs> I, I guess that sounds harsh, but it's the truth because you, if you have a therapist, maybe you have a therapist who's really good with their clients, but they're not culturally working in to your, like as a team in your practice, it's a tough call. And yet what, I, what I'll what i say from my own experience of that exact thing is that when we allow behaviour that's not in alignment with our values, we're actually saying to the rest of the team, it's completely okay to behave like that. Mm. And it can be really tough to make a call to say, you know what, and and I guess it leads into management as well. But, you know, mm. sometimes you, you've got to make that tough call to go, what what am I what is what else is this allowing in my business by allowing this behavior and just kind of ignoring it you know or or putting it under the rug or um allowing it because because we don't want to rock the boat um yeah I think it's really important to be really really honest sometimes with the team members that you have um and just check like and the great question to ask yourself is if this person left and came back would you hire them again and yeah. if the answer and that that's telling yeah that's you, telling. you have your answer that's so good how would you um advise someone who felt, feels like they're in a position where they feel like they're micromanaging when actually it's just not the right fit yeah yeah um, well look I think it, it comes down to uh, first of all knowing what that mission is and those values mm. and then having systems that back that up so um I believe that it's important to give people the absolute best opportunity to be able to learn how you want things done. Yeah, like I was I was really, really fussy about the way that my staff did our towels, yeah, because I worked at a day spa. So I would roll on a Wednesday, I would roll 300 bath towels. Yeah. So <laughs> I like them to look nice. Yeah, otherwise I'm going to watch these things while I'm massaging, doing relaxation yeah. massage. Oh, towels not right like <laughs> when I when I came to I had a very you know someone would say fussy I would say high standard you know like yeah. it's about <laughs> of how we would roll towels and so I was really clear with my team that we would do towel rolling training yeah like mm. you've got to do it like this you've got to pull them back a little bit traction them and then roll them and you should be able to stack them quite high if they're rolled properly and yeah. they should be the the edge of the towels to the back of the wall yeah okay now some of you listening will be like yes yes she gets me <laughs> and other people are like no seriously lady you are like oh, you're like that's crazy um so for me when it came because that kind of stuff can get really micromanagey like how do you actually call that out yeah. and so Part of, I think, I think one of the mistakes that, that therapists make when they're hiring is they ignore behavior for a long time, then get really annoyed after like six months mm. and go full aggressive mode. And so I think it's actually better to swap that round. And it's almost like, don't be afraid to almost micromanage in the first month. You know, actually do lots of handholding, point out when they do things well, point out when it's not in alignment because if you're giving them that encouragement and that feedback and you're also um, giving them the feedback of that's not right often by the time they get to that first month you don't have to keep telling them the things and if you do then that might be really highlighting of that perhaps they're not a cultural fit um, and I think that that's probably the biggest mistake I see people make is that they will ignore behavior and then and yeah. it's like, you know what, just walk that round. It's almost like don't be afraid to communicate a lot in that first month because it will really set the culture of this is what, this is how we do it here. This is how we do it here. This is how we do it here. Oh, then it's somewhere else differently. Great, but this is how we do it here. Yeah, this is what it means to have a clinic of excellence or to, um, yeah. I think, yeah, and I think that, that that will swap that micromanaging around. That's great advice. Um, I think it's also good for to for the the hired to find out if it's a good fit for them like it has to be yeah. this is a two-way <laughs> two-way relationship yeah. um and if you just hear about the way the tales are done that's fine but yeah 
<laughs> I was like that with my towel, so you definitely speaking to me. <laughs> I got it. I couldn't concentrate on a on a massage. I'm like, all I'm thinking about is that towel that's out of place. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's my eyes twitching. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, all right, perfect. Well, since we're talking about um, finding talent, um, let's talk about finding the right fit for your team. Let's start at the beginning with your hiring process. Where do you start with trying to find the right fit? Yeah. So I think um, being able to communicate the passion that you have, and this comes down to marketing, um, which I love, and marketing is super fun, and marketing is all about communication. And what we tend to do is our first first draft of, of most ads are uh, you need to be this and this and this and this and we want this and you must be this and this and this and this and this. And unless you perform three miracles, don't apply. Mm -hmm. And what we what I tend to say <laughs> is lead with your heart, not your words. So share the passion that you have. If you're if you're a values based business, talk about the talk to the values first. Mm -hmm. And if you are going to be the kind of person that wants to create an imprint, if you want to mentor someone, if you really want to share the experience and wisdom that you have. Put that at the stop of your ad. You're like, actually share that. I have a passion for helping therapists grow. Oh, wow. That's because that instantly says something different. So, and then, yeah, criteria, but I wouldn't put too much criteria in your ad. Put that on a landing page or put that on your website or put that somewhere where they can see. Because obviously you want to make sure you're not just getting randos. Like you want to make sure they're really, <laughs> you, want a, you want a therapist, they've got to be qualified, you know, that kind of stuff. Um. And I think that that's, so that's the first thing that I would say. Normally, almost every person that I work with that is hiring someone, they send me their first draft of their ad and I just take the stuff that they put at the bottom because that's when they finally got a bit fluffier and a bit nicer mm. and we just put that at the top. <laughs> oh, okay, let's leave that. <laughs> let's, all this stuff here, that's great. That can be in a job description. Let's get rid of that. Let's get rid of that. Put that all over there. And so the person is really just getting the heartbeat of who you are. Have mm. a lovely photo of yourself. If you've got other team members, put a photo of your team. Um, if you've got a clinic that looks lovely, use photos of the clinic. Like it, if you think of like everything has to be corporate and very fancy, we're just not. Yeah, like we're, we're massage therapists. Okay, that's just how we roll. We're much more friendly and and I can say it because I'm a therapist. We're a bit fluffy. Yeah, like it's okay to put that out there. We can be. <laughs> can. Um, the other thing I would say is if you don't want to have the same clinic that everyone else has hire people in the way that other people aren't doing. And so one of the ways that we have hired many people um, in our clinic and also in our current business is that we will do a Facebook Live in community Ooh. and and have like an apply here button and they get, it goes to a form and goes through the website and other stuff. But what I found is that people who listen to that and look at that are like, that's a really different way to hire someone. Like, really? You're, uh, oh, okay. You're not just like putting it on secret Craigslist or, you know, like this is like, this is really, really different. Not to say that we don't use, uh, you know, actual mm. employment platforms as well. But if you're going to do something, like if you're, if you're not the usual clinic down the road or somewhere else, be different, display and highlight that, you know, like take a video of yourself through your clinic saying, Hey, we're hiring. Um, this is the space. What do you think? We'd really love to see you. These are the values of the business. This is what we stand for. This is who we're looking for. Um, and what that does is give, gives people an experience of who you are. And that's a little bit like marketing for massage businesses that if, you, you know, we, we often say that you want people to get what you do before you before they come in. So if you are quite unique in the way that you treat get them to know that because you don't want them to come in for a pregnancy massage if you're a high-end sports therapist you know like and you want to make sure they get what you're doing and I say the same when you're hiring like actually um talk to that person it's almost like having a niche but for your team mm. yeah so it's like you have a niche for your business or you might have niches for your business um how do you get that person and go this is who I'm looking for I want a therapist that does this and this and is like this and has this kind of temperament this sort of personality speak to that and you'll often attract them in uh, and again it starts with that intentionality doing a little bit of groundwork first to go okay I definitely want an employee I want them to be you know want to have a little bit of experience you know or they could be fresh out like that's fine I've, this is who I'm looking for and you can then speak to that and speak to the things that that kind of person might like and we've found some really great team members that way because it's 
not your usual way to do business. And honestly, the company that we run is not, we're not usual. You know, we're, we are a little bit of a, a different kind of company. And so we found that a really interesting and fun. And it was just literally one day I just had woke up and I went, oh, I'll do a live. We'll just see if anyone around wants it. And it worked so well that I was like, yeah, I'll keep, yeah, that's intentional. Yeah, we'll keep yeah. doing that. <laughs> I meant to do that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah <totally. laughs> It speaks a lot for your, like following your, what you really want to do and what you really are. You're following your values. So you trusting your instinct more and attracting people that that um, align with all that. So that's really great advice. Um, I was going to actually ask how else you're finding people um, apart from the lives. It's very cool. Um, is there anything else you're doing or any other anything, any other tips you can give to people? Look, Facebook community groups. So especially if you were in, um, I mean, if you're looking for a, 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 a an admin person, your local community groups can be really great. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're looking for therapists, find therapist groups in your area um, and just speak to them. You can even put your ad in it. I mean, check the rules, make sure, you know, don't don't be that person. <laughs> check the rules that <laughs> you're on fire and are not allowed to post. Um, but again, it can be just, a, it's like massage therapists are always looking on your employment platforms um, just simply because we're not a corporate bunch. So doing that, um, going to local colleges, you know, and asking them, do you have anyone going into uh, the student clinics and meeting people uh, is a great way. And I, I have done that. I actually worked uh, in the TAFE system in Australia. And that was one of the ways that I found great team members was to actually work, work as a teacher and um, be like, All right, this person is a great cultural fit. This person is a great cultural fit. And again, it was actually one of the students that I looked at one day, I went, huh, you're my niche. Oh, of staff. Like it, I mean, some of this stuff that I'm doing, it, it happened because I just literally saw it in front of me and it kind of smacked me about the head and I'm like, that's a really good idea. Um, <laughs> so it, but you, you don't have to go and get a teaching qualification, go and teach at a college for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can just go and actually, if they've got a student clinic, go and find them out and, and or talk, like create a relationship with their teachers as well to be like, is there anyone in here, anyone in this class that you'd hire? Anyone you recommend? Um, and that can be, yeah, some great connections. And if you've got team uh, already, ask them. You know, I think there's some there's some ways that I have found hiring to be really effective. Amazing. And what about in the hiring process or looking for people? Are there things that you've seen when you've mentored or or maybe you've gone through it yourself? Um, common mistakes that people do or um, things that they can maybe avoid that we've all gotten into the habit of doing? <laughs> Any like yeah, common missteps that people make? I think two things to do that really help avoid mistakes. Uh, number one is to get them in for a, a trial. So mm -hmm. when you interview, like, interview over the phone, if you think that they're going to be all right, I would set aside a few days when I was hiring for a team and I would tell them up front, um, uh, it's going to be a, it's an hour and a half interview. And so the first 45 minutes is we're going to have a chat. If that works, then I'd love you to give me a, um, so yeah, a half an hour massage and I've got somebody in my clinic. So either one of my other team or a, another, a client who was really good at giving feedback mm. and I would tell them up front, that's what I wanted. Now, um, part of my story is that I have scoliosis. So I had major back surgery at 15 and I've got ribs and discs removed and I've got, um, mm. metabolic in side of my spine. So for me, it was kind of fun because, you know, I'd be like, okay, so we do the interview and then I would, no, half an hour interview, that's right, and then half an hour feature the massages. So um, I would, I'd be like, okay, great. So now I'm going to hand over to you and be like, here's, here's everything. Do you need anything else? There's oils there and there's towels are there. Okay, great. I'm like, any other questions? I'd be like, no, um, I'll just leave you undressed. I'm like, if you're not going to ask me questions, if you're not going to ask about a history, this is going to be very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so you get undressed and I would get undressed and they'd walk back in and be like, ah! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> going on. There's a few scars. There's, you yeah. know, but it was actually really good because I like how do you respond to that? You know, yeah. and that so in some ways that kind of chaos that I was accidentally throwing them mm. into was actually a really good thing to see how did they handle that. Um and some of them would actually stop and say, Okay, is there anything else I need to know? Is, and and mm. other people wouldn't. And you know, I remember anything from because then I could feel how what their treatment felt like as well were they caring were they confident did they were they shaking were their hands sweaty was that nerves is that but you can tell as a therapist what's mm. that someone's got to you just feel it instantly when someone has that that gift um and 
I remember one lady saying to me, oh, yeah, that feels really tight. What's that called again? Oh, you're trapped. Yeah, yeah, that feels really tight. And I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> probably not the language. Might that not I work out. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, thank you so much for that. We'll wrap up. <laughs> Um, and then, yeah, having them treat the other person and then that was really helpful as well, especially if you've mm. got a, or a staff member or actually my mum was often a really good category because she was she was very good at being at it or she is very good at articulating. This feels really good. I don't like that. I really mm. enjoy that. I really love the way that you did this. You know, find someone who can articulate that. Uh, so I think that's that can be that is a way when you when you interview like that you're really getting a sense of not just what they're saying but what they're feeling like and obviously you're hiring them as a therapist. Remembering that we can like when we hire on culture, we're looking for their personality, their temperament, their style. We mm. can train other things. Um, so that you know that that's kind of what I was looking for. The other thing I would say is when you're interviewing them. Ask them for specific things. So one of our one of our sneaky things that we did when we hired our admin was fill in this form, like to apply to fill in the a form. But then we would put a note at the end that said, "Can you please email me your resume with the subject line? I think I'm the one." Now that is very attention to detail kind of behaviour. But if I've got an admin, I want them having attention to detail. Mm. So if you filled in the form but you didn't email me with that subject line specifically, I'm sorry, but you don't pay attention yeah. to detail. So part of that was actually getting people to hire in a way, like getting them to behave in the hiring process, mm. how you want them to hire at the end of it. So sort of starting with the end in mind. And it's the same with staff. Like with therapists, a little bit different because I don't, I don't know that that's a relevant skill for me personally as, as an employer. That wouldn't be a relevant skill for a therapist. But mm. what I would ask them is, can you tell me a specific time where you had to resolve something that was challenging in a workplace environment? So that was mm. one question. The other question I used to ask was around gift vouchers. So for oh. us, a lot of gift vouchers were, this is very random, but this was quite oddly specific and would really it, it helped me know what this person was going to be like. So gift vouchers for us were often sold to our, like we our clients would buy them for their family and friends. Yeah. So I would say to them, um, in this situation, um, uh, somebody has called and their gift voucher ran out a week ago. What would you, what would your instincts to do? Like not necessarily what you think I want you to do, but I'd love to know how would you like to handle it? And they were like, um, because what I was actually looking for was, I'd probably say, okay, and book them in and then call you and check it's okay. Hmm. Totally fine. Because you know what? That's good, great customer service, you know, in my mind. If it's three years out of date, it's a whole different conversation. But this is like, <laughs> it's just kind of, how much of the rules are you willing to follow? Hmm. How much customer service are you willing to go around? Will you check in with your boss around whatever decision you've made? Because they're going to be faced with those situations all the time. And so that yeah. would be a great question to ask around gift vouchers and how they'd handle certain situations that were a little bit askew, but also that we knew this this stuff happens. Yeah. So there, there were some questions that I found really helpful in the hiring process that elicited the kind of behavior and qualities that I wanted because I wanted someone that was really customer centric focused um, and the response to that told me whether they were really rules bound which wasn't mm. going to be helpful for us or if they were like well I want to check with you but really I'd really want to just give it to them the voucher because it's only a week and like, yes that's yeah. The <laughs> yeah and the thing is it probably isn't uh, right or wrong it's what would you really do and then we'll yeah. figure out if you're a good fit for here Correct. So, yeah, yeah that right. strategy is brilliant, setting the intention and the culture right from the start. What do you do if you're on the fence? You're still not sure after that hour and a half, two hour interview, what would you do? Um, What was it that made you not sure? Can I ask? I, I know that's a I funny can't question. even. Yeah, I know. I'm trying to we think. Oh, it was a while ago. <laughs> I can't even remember. Because <laughs> I fair. remember thinking, oh, I'm not sure. Like, I like them, but I don't know if it's going to work out. I, I, I can't remember them the real detail now but and I did end up hiring in the man in the end and they were great in the end yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I think for me um the uh, the thing I remembered was trusting my gut yeah um yeah is there anything like tangible someone can go on if they're on the fence would you recommend a second interview 
Uh, possibly a second interview, but I think that's where that's like you're kind of getting a second interview by having the other person give a massage, mm. give them a massage and getting their feedback. I yeah. really enjoyed it when they did this. I felt very comfortable. That's what I was always looking for. Um, how comfortable did you feel with them? Did you like the way that they, they, it's not so much the treatment, honestly, the treatment mm. can be trained. It's the way that you go about it. How's that pressure? Do you need me to check in? You know, or that's feeling really tight. What does that feel like to you? Like those kinds of things to me were way more important. Our communication mm. during the treatment was more important to me than the actual treatment itself. So that's probably what I would fall back to. And you can always do a probation period. Yeah, and you should always do a probation period. Um, up to three months uh, is a great time. And especially if you're like, if you've got your systems in place to be able to hire someone quickly, get them up to scratch quickly, get them trained quickly, get them booked quickly, get them rebooked quickly, um, then you know that hiring, there's a lot less risk in that. Um, if it's your first one, maybe get a second interview. Um, and and I also know that it's kind of okay to, like, you know when you make pancakes, the first one's a bit dodge. Yeah, this like one's never right. <laughs> I think it's the same with hiring. It's like get it over and just hire the wrong person first, get it out of your system, and then yeah. no one can learn from it. <laughs> and you'll learn through it as well. You'll learn all of the things we've been talking yes. about. Yeah. Um, as far as other systems to have in place when you've got when you're hiring someone, um, what else what else do you have? Do you have like something things that you always do every time? What kind of systems do you have to make sure the same culture is built with every employee? Yeah. Well, I sat down and wrote down uh, like a checklist for myself because I was hiring quite uh, a lot. There was one time where I hired five staff members in the period of like a few weeks mm. and I just needed to be like, where am I at with who? And, <laughs> and oh my gosh, this is, I could yeah. not go on the fly. So I actually created, and I've still, I've still got it in my garage. It's like a, um, a new staff member hiring pack. Um, that had everything in it that meant I could photocopy all the you know all the pieces of paper I mean nowadays you can do it electronically that makes life a lot easier um, but remember it was a long time ago I've been doing this a long while so um, I had all the bits and pieces that I needed were actually in a folder that was labeled you know new staff hire and then I would I got my um, admin to photocopy a couple of them so I just had them in the drawer so that if someone dropped out and I had to hire, I had the opportunity to just pull that out and off I went. And so for actually onboarding and hiring, that was really helpful. And then I had like a, you know, day one onboarding checklist uh, that I had a 30-day checklist, I had a 60-day checklist and a 90-day checklist of where they should be at. So that gave me the criteria of what I was expecting. I wasn't expecting them to rebook every one of their clients in the first week. I was expecting them to have a minimum 75% rebooking rate by the end of the first month because of the training that we would do. So like for me it's like you know I don't want to I want to have high standards but I don't want them to be ridiculous and not achieve not not feel like it's attainable um and so I think having some timelines for yourself of knowing I want them to be doing this by then I want them to be doing this by then I expect them to be doing that by then it also means that you're not expecting everything today and it's okay for that to take time mm. yes yeah does that answer the question yeah that's perfect that's amazing the systems in place always help um yeah. it's just nice to fall back on them um, do you have, out of curiosity, what are the things that you felt like, or do you feel like um, are trainable and what are your non-negotiables? Okay. Um, things that I think are trainable is um, like being able to communicate effectively, knowing what that looks like, sounds like, and feels like, and actually helping them learn that. Um, I think you can train skill. You know, these are the things that I've done in my practice that have worked really well on clients. Um, these are the modalities. We would have training days where I would get, um, we had an osteopath and a naturopath and a life coach renting a room out of the clinic. Um, and I would get them in to train around, you know, gut health or hormones or neck or showing their favorite techniques. And I think all that is trainable. Not negotiables for me was, was just customer centered care and having, being a people person. That was really important for me. Um, and it's, it's still important for me that people are like, yeah, that was, that had to be um, paramount, I think. And because that was the kind of clinic that I had, and that was the kind of clinic that I wanted. And it, it kind of perpetuated that kind of culture. Mm. Yeah. I love that. You find out what's most important and the rest follows. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think let's move on to management styles. We can, I think you could probably have a whole um, webinar on itself about management styles. <laughs> um but what do you, what would you say are the types of management styles? How important is it to know yours? Can you figure it out on the job? What are your thoughts? 
management styles i think is really important um i think unchecked and un and not not intentional we do tend to micromanage or ignore everything and then micromanage or blow up etc so learning how to actually manage your team well is important um often looking at past experiences of when we've received management mm. and learning what was that what came up for us because if you've had a really aggressive or bossy style manager that you hated we tend to then flip into okay it's fine just anything mm. goes and so it's like kind of <laughs> Doing a little bit of work around that so that it's not, that's not what you're avoiding. Um, but I think being clear, clear is kind. Brene Brown talks about that. Clear is kind. And that transposes to systems and what's okay and what's not okay. Clear is kind. So be really clear. You know, when you're, when you're, ma- when your management style should be, be really clear. Great book uh, called The One Minute Manager by, oh, someone whose name I can't remember, but you can look it up. Um <laughs> It's great. It's a really small book and I found it really helpful because one of the things he talked about was find people, catch people doing something right and tell them. Mm. I noticed that you interacted with that client really well. I love the conversation you had at the end of the treatment. Well done. I noticed that you put all the files away at the end of the day. Really appreciate that. Well done. I've noticed that what you've been writing in your client history notes is really helpful. It's super detailed and I love it. Well done. I've noticed that the towels are looking amazing. Well done. You know, like just Mm -hmm. those things and call it out because often we ignore those. We don't even mention Mm -hmm. them. Like, well, they should be doing that. Yeah, they should be, but they don't know that that's normal yet. So find what they're doing well and point it out because then when you have to find something they're not doing well and point that out, you kind of bank a bunch of brownie points yeah. and it makes it much easier and you've got a huge level of respect in the room because you're not just like oh you didn't do that right oh you didn't do it and then they're like but I was here 10 minutes early I'm so sorry that I was three minutes late today like oh my gosh mm-hmm. it's like you know find what they're doing well and tell them um I think that that can really help as well yeah I think that goes also quite nicely into trying to strike a balance between um, addressing the issues and also being supportive right yeah yeah, definitely. We used to have a saying in our clinic that it was like, as a person, I have your back and I care about you. As a business, you leave your stuff at the door and you come to work and serve your clients, which was a way of kind of navigating how do you get people to show up and do their best work in the treatment room while still having a kind and open conversation because maybe they've had a really rough time at the moment. Mm. So the like in that, it's like the expectation is that you're going to come to work and you're going to perform your best, regardless of what's happened. We're all busy. We've all had stuff go on in the day. And part of it is we've got to leave that there, park it. And and if you are struggling, come and chat to me and I'm happy to talk to you, but not at the expense of doing your job. Mm. I think that, that that's really, that's important to be able to learn how to do that. And I think it, it is a bit of a learned skill to be able yeah. to navigate that. Yeah. You can make that goal for yourself, I guess, as well as a manager. Um, yeah. to learn your own management style do you have any um any like little milestones for yourself um in management I want my team to be here I want my team I want myself to do this do you do that for yourself as well as for your hires yeah definitely I think I'm a fairly aware person so mm-hmm. I'm mindful of how my own behavior can play out in my team um and it I think that I think that's really important because it it then you know, if someone comes to you with feedback, you know, if a staff member comes to you with feedback, you can take it on board because it's like, you know, I really, and I would always say to my team, I really appreciate that. Thank you for sharing. I may not agree with it. I might not action it. I won't actually do anything about it. However, when you're open to that feedback, your team knows it. And then and then I'd be like, and I also would never be like, yes, we're going to implement that today. I'd always give myself time and space. And I would say that to them, like, if you notice things, especially when they're new, ask new people, stuff about your clinic because they're open they're not <laughs> yeah in front of our eyes of I've been on this for 20 years they're actually seeing with you I talk to me if there's stuff you're seeing that we could do better can you please share that with me and I would say it doesn't mean we're going to implement it straight away but I love I'm really open to new ideas and then people would respect that they'd love it so they would share stuff and I'd be like okay that's really good let me think about how we could implement that mm. you know like we're I might not be able to afford to put air conditioning in every single room in the clinic or to, you know, do it. However, I really appreciate that you care enough about the business to let me know um, or that you're not appreciating my, that I've been really blunt lately. Okay, great. Mm. I, thank you for sharing that with me. Because if, if I'm giving them feedback, then I have to be able to be open to the feedback myself. And I think that means that you're leading with the heart of a servant, the heart of a king, um, which is one of our, one of our values to really, mm. um, to have that heart-centered leadership when, when you're leading. 
Oh, that's so good. It kind of ties back into what you're saying in the beginning about, you know, bringing them into the process. You know, we're yeah. learning together. We're doing this together. It makes everyone more invested in each other and in the success of the business too. Um, I guess that takes us quite nicely into learning styles. If we're learning from each other, um, I guess we need to, I mean, as um, someone hiring people, you need to appreciate different types of learning styles. Not everyone's the same. Not everyone's going to like take things on board the same. Um, what would you recommend about learning different learning styles of people and how to how to navigate that learning styles are great I I I, I'm fascinated by human behavior so when I learned that this was a thing I'm like oh this is so good I I love it (laughs) because I think the more people feel got and heard and seen and felt the more people are likely to lean in and have buy-in in your business and that's something that other places are not going to give potential hires that's something that you can intentionally go after as a heart-centered practitioner and I get really excited about that because if if people like learning styles is like a super highway it's like how we take on board information so if you can speak into someone's super highway they're going to get what you have to say heaps quicker than Mm. you keep doing it over and over again and just like why I didn't this person listen to me it's like (laughs) maybe they need to hear it in a different way Um, And so look, the main communication styles, the main sort of learning styles are visual, auditory and kinesthetic. And visual is like they'll they'll use words like, you know, I really see what you're doing there. I I noticed, uh, I see. And so you'll find them like you can you can actually listen for the code, because if you're an employer of choice, you'll take the time to listen for the code and you can listen in their interview. You can listen while they're massaging. You can listen. And it's really helpful to know what's their super highway of how they take on board information. And because you're really clever, you're listening for that code. So um, auditory, they're going to be hearing what you're saying. You know, I really, the way that you're talking about that is really helpful for me. I understand what you're saying. Thank you for taking the time to tell me that information. Yeah, you know, they, they're listening for, ah, this person's auditory. And mm. kinesthetic is, you know, I really feel that this is going to be a good place or a good fit for me. I really, I like the way that you, uh, they might talk about connection um, and they'll use more feeling words because they're wired like that and that's their super highway. So that's how they're taking board information. Um, so part of it, there's two two elements. It's number one is that you are going to listen for this code because you're a really clever, amazing heart-centered <laughs> therapist and you want to be an employer of choice. Number two is the way that you train is you use all three. Yeah, so you Mm. show them how to do it. You tell them how to do it and you actually do it with them. The tail rolling was an example. So this is what I want it to look like. This is what it, this is how I want you to do it. I'd tell them, I'd Mm. show them. And then I get them to experience it too. Okay, so yeah, you're going to put, yeah, you're going to traction it back. You're going to roll it up really tight. You're going to put that edge right at the back of the wall. Like you, (laughs) the way that we went about it. So if you've got systems and they're just written, they're not necessarily seeing how to do it. If you've got systems that you're just verbal and you've got somebody who's highly kinesthetic, they will never understand what you're mm-hmm. saying. If you have um, videos that actually show people what it is you're doing, you're often are covering all three, especially if you're using language that has describing feelings, you're going to actually be able to embody all three of those super highway learning styles for your team. So you know individually what your team are looking for and what they what they want to hear, what they want to feel, but then you can also use that in your training to intentionally go after all three of those things. Um, and I think that that creates a really great culture. That is fascinating. I haven't actually, I didn't actually know too much about this. I've heard the terms, but never really knew about that and never knew how to apply it to management. So that's so cool. Thanks for sharing that. Um, have you found any, if, you've, if you have um, employees of different styles, do you find yourself adapting constantly to them? Um, yeah. yeah, how how do you navigate that? It's maybe if they're between each other, you're trying to navigate conflict or something. Has anything arisen in that regard for you? Look, I think um, being able to, like I said, using all three in your training mm-hmm. helps because it, it's pretty rare that someone's not going to get it if you're telling them, showing them, and they're they're actually having the experience of it. That is your ultimate way to learn. And even as adult educators, that's how they teach you to, to teach as well. Um but what I would find is that I would call it out. So let's say rebooking, for example. People are like, oh, I don't want to rebook because I feel really bossy. We would do rebooking training um, where they would have to rebook me 
Um, we would, and I would, you know, we'd talk it through, we'd say the words, we'd, you know, do all that kind of stuff. Um, we'd train through a script and how to overcome objections and all that kind of stuff. And then they'd have to stand there and do it. And I, what I found was that my team was more likely to rebook than have to do role play with Leisha. <laughs> yeah. So like, you two yeah. You either come, you would just do the thing or yeah. <laughs> we pretend yeah. to do the thing. <laughs> Free book. Oh, I don't want to come back in. <laughs> no, 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 that's an objection. You know, like that was way scarier, way more uncomfortable than actually just saying, oh, see you again next week. Oh, okay, cool. No worries. I'll come yeah. in. So, yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, so good. Um, I have noticed now that it's almost at the top of the hour. The time has gone so quickly. Thank you so much for all of this info. It's jam-packed full of little gems. Um, thank you so much again. Um, what I'd like to ask my guests uh, to put you on the spot a little bit, if someone forgets everything you've said and remembers one idea, concept, thought from the talk, what would you say that is? I would say that if you are a heart-centered therapist, lead with that to be a great employer. And everything else will fall into place. Oh, I love it. And Elita, how can we find you? If someone wants to learn more, find you on, on online, uh, where can we find you? Um, so uh, my business, our business is called The Health Leader Co. We are across all of the socials and we have a website. Um, and yeah, more than happy to, would love to get in touch. You can send me a friend request on Facebook. Um, you can email me, you can text me, like whatever, whichever is your favorite channel, uh, definitely get in touch because we love to be able to help therapists elevate their practice and amplify the, yeah, amplify what it is that they do in the treatment room. Oh, thank you so much. I'll pop um, all of Alicia's um how you can find her, all her contacts into this chat um, for anyone that's interested, but she is part of our community. So feel free to reach out um, if you have any questions that you didn't have time to um, ask us today. Um, but thank you so much. I hope we get to see you again soon and enjoy the conference. I can't wait to hear all about it. Thank you so much, Nicole. I really appreciate having me on today. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. See ya.